All right. So welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce a talk by uh, Samantha. And Samantha has been roaming the UCSB campus from neuroscience, physics, clean room fabrication. So Samantha, please go ahead and explain about your research. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is developing an optoelectronic imaging system for organoids. And uh, this is my senior thesis presentation. So I hope you will all enjoy. So what are organoids? Well, they're miniature organs, which mimic organ functionality. So for example, if you had an organoid lung, the lungs would actually inflate. Um, and if you had, say, an organoid heart, the heart would beat. Uh, organoid brain, like this uh, cross section here, uh, the neurons in the brain will actually fire. Um, and they are grown from stem cells, uh, which makes it kind of easy to, to grow lots of them and you know, differentiate them to any kind of different organ that you can think of. Uh, and this makes them very useful for kind of research purposes because uh, you can kind of study how tissue grows and develops together. Um, there's applications to pharmacology and genetics because you can do drug testing uh, where you can have trial treatments where you um, kind of test novel drugs on these organoids that you've grown instead of kind of testing them on real people. Um, and then of course there are fundamental questions at the heart of biology and especially neurobiology that can be answered by doing research on organoids, um, such as can we grow and study a human brain? And in doing so, can we kind of try to understand how consciousness comes about? Um, and additionally, can we grow biological computers where we can use, say, neurons as bits and their action potentials as sorts of calculations in this computer? Um, and kind of getting into how do we study organoids, uh, I'm going to restrict my definition of organoids to organoids that are electrically active, such as the brain, heart, and retina. Um, and kind of, you, know, you can grow any sort of organoid, but to study them with uh, a microelectrode array, they need to be electrically active. And the reason for this is um, you put the cells <laughs> on, on this uh, organoid array, and it's this very densely, tightly packed array where you've got lots and lots of electrodes, and you've also got some reference voltage. Um, and so your cells will live in this, this uh, very pixelated part right here. Um, and when, say, if you have a neuron, uh, an action potential fires, uh, you can see all of these little spikes here uh, would be kind of the, the voltage that you get out from this neuron. Um, and as you kind of increase the, the number of electrodes that you have, you get finer and finer resolution. And this allows you to study kind of populations of cells as well as the individual cell. And you can kind of see that in the uh, local field potential where you've got sort of this wiggly behavior that's kind of in all of these traces. But the individual spikes, which kind of represent individual cells, uh, are not in every single trace. Uh, and so some of the electrodes are picking up signals that, not, that other electrodes are not. Um, and to do this, you can take these electrodes and you put them in a, in a nice container with a petri dish where it's kind of all sealed up and you can put your cells in your, your uh, kind of saline solution so that the cells don't die, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you kind of have all of these uh, surrounding peripheral electronics to um, study, study the cells, you know, send signals in so that you can kind of electrically activate these neurons or these cells, whatever cells you want to put on there. Um, or uh, read signals out and try to kind of understand what's happening. Now, you'll notice that the um, kind of microelectrode array that I just showed you is not transparent. Uh, and the kind of goal of my project was to make a transparent microelectrode array. Uh, and this is so that you can have your voltage readout and kind of see how, say, an active potential propagates down a neuron in real time and combine it with uh, calcium imaging techniques that have been developed by, by biologists um, and kind of cover each other's bases because there are aspects of using the um, electrode arrays that are kind of introduce biasing where you know certain electrodes uh, are going to have neurons on them or cells on them uh, and this means that uh, you know you're going to have many more electrodes than cells and so you're going to you know pick out the um, electrodes that have cells on them and you might sort of overestimate the prevalence of some of the factors that you're seeing in your culture. Uh, but if you have these imaging techniques, you're, you're less likely to do that. So by kind of combining these two things, we can get a more accurate picture of the culture that we're hoping to study. Uh, and so this is a rather involved project that's a you know, 
large collaboration. I've been working in the Baumeister group, which has kind of been focusing on actually building this device. Uh, we've been collaborating with these groups here uh, who are hoping to kind of use our device to uh, perform experiments of their own. So how do we go from you know, just looking at the, at the whiteboard and saying, hey, I'd like to build a transparent microelectrode array to actually having one and having these sorts of finished prototypes? Um, and what we ended up doing was kind of breaking this into two pieces. Uh, and the first piece was kind of building the electrodes themselves, getting, getting this transparent substrate with electrodes on it. And then after that, we'll worry about all of the complicated electrical engineering that you need to do to send signals in, read signals out, and all, all of that mess that isn't this little glass bit in the middle. So uh, kind of walking through the fabrication steps, um, we started with a fused silica uh, wafer, which is transparent. Um, and this is kind of a, a top-down view of the wafer, and this is a cross-section view of the wafer, and as I walk through the fabrication steps, you'll kind of see these updated, and it should hopefully give you a, a better understanding of how this all kind of gets built up layer by layer. So how big is that? This uh, is four inches in diameter and 500 microns thick. So starting with electron beam physical vapor deposition, uh, we deposit indium tin oxide, which uh, is a material that is transparent when you put a thin film of it down, uh, and it's also electrically conductive. Um, and uh, this, this system kind of sends charged particles into your ITO, uh, and it kind of gets shot up into your wafer, which is above the, uh, you know, use, use the, the um, sample of material. Uh, and at the end of this, we have a nice clean sheet of ITO, on top of our wafer. This is all well and good, but we need to kind of pattern it because this is very clearly not electrodes. This is, this is just a nice layer of, of uh, material. Um, so this is kind of the mask design that I made, uh, and this is kind of the shape of the electrodes that we want to have at the end. Um, and you can see there's uh, you know, this reference electrode for making your uh, voltage measurements. There are bond pads, which will be kind of later when we're kind of trying to put this into uh, some sort of electronics, this will allow us to connect from our electronics and kind of make this uh, bridge between the electronics and the wafer itself. And of course, the uh, kind of blown up area over here, which is the sensing area where all of the electrodes themselves are. And the electrodes are uh, 10 microns in diameter, and each of these electrodes in the center corresponds to one bond pad out here. So to do this, uh, we use this tool uh, called the Masco Salt Liner, which basically allows us to perform photolithography. Uh, and to kind of give you an idea of how this works, you take your design, uh, this thing, um, you put it into this machine, and it has this laser that kind of fires the laser in this pattern that you've, you've uh, designed. Uh, and the reason for this is before we put our wafer into this machine, we cover it in a layer of photoresist, which is a sacrificial layer uh, which reacts with light. And because you're shining the laser on it in this pattern, um, it reacts with light, and then you can develop it kind of the way you might develop uh, pho photographs in uh, like a, a dark room. Um, and at the end of it, the photoresist will have been removed from the areas where the laser shined. Uh, and this means that now we have a lovely layer of photoresist on top of our um, ITO, and it's kind of only in this pattern of the electrodes. Uh, and this means that when we uh, go on to etch in some sort of dry etching tool, uh, the ITO that's underneath this mask will be protected, and all of the ITO that's kind of out here and isn't protected will be removed. So we go to the reactive ion etching tool, uh, which you know, has this plasma, these gases, they ignite, um, and you can etch away your indium tin oxide, uh, leaving you uh, with this substrate, and there's a plasma cleaning step that you can do to kind of remove the photoresist at the end. And there you have it, electrodes on our wafer. And this is excellent, this is kind of exactly what we wanted, but in order for them to be useful, uh, they need to be insulated. And the reason for this is there's going to be this media on top of it, uh, and this media for the cells is going to kind of short all of your electrodes together. So if you try to read signals out or send signals in, all you're going to get is this jumbled mash, and it's not really going to be effective at all. Um, so if we deposit uh, silicon dioxide, with the Plasma Enhanced Chemical Vapor Deposition Tool, uh, which is another uh, transparent material. Uh, you can just think of it basically as like glass. 
um, over the top. And silicon dioxide is uh, not conducting. So at the end of it, you kind of have covered all of your electrodes with silicon dioxide, and they're all kind of insulated. And kind of the final step is opening holes in your silicon dioxide so you can still access your electrodes and your bond paths. This means we need to go back to the photolithography tool, uh, design another mask. This time, we just want um, these bond pads over here, the reference electrode, and little openings for the electrodes themselves. Uh, you can see in this close-up, uh, it may not be apparent from this image, but these holes are actually slightly bigger than the um, electrodes themselves, so that when you kind of try to line this up, if there's some small misalignment, you can still get a, a good device where all of the electrodes are actually open. So back to the photolithography tool, we put on our sacrificial layer, we shine the laser in our pattern, uh, we develop it, and then uh, at the end of this, we have um, kind of photoresist covering all of these areas out here and no photoresist on the bond pads, the reference electrode, or the electrodes in the center. Which means when we go to the inductively coupled plasma etching tool, uh, we can etch right through those areas that we've opened up and we'll have access to our ITO at the end. And this is kind of our, our finished device. So we've got our ITO bond pads, our ITO electrodes, and our ITO reference electrode, uh, and everything else is covered under this nice layer of insulating silicon dioxide. Uh, and then this is just some nice pictures of the end fabrication. Um, for scale, this, this scale bar is one millimeter. Um, so this, this kind of sensing area where all the uh, electrodes are is kind of basically a two millimeter by two millimeter square. Um, and then over here, uh, you can see kind of a close-up of those actual openings in the silicon dioxide layer. Now, yeah. How long does it take to manufacture this from starting from the wafer, the silicon wafer? Uh, I mean, if you just like look at the, uh, I think it's like 10 hours to 12 hours of like just being in the clean room fabricating, but there's like waiting time in between. So it, it like, I guess if, if you got lucky with being able to book the tools uh, like two days. So 10 hours of human involvement time, two days plus uh, total time. Yeah, more or less. Just a few months of development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and support of the gratitude. Sure, sure. And yeah. a lot of funding. Yeah. <laughs> and, and designing the masks also takes a lot of time. Well, sure, sure. I mean, the design yeah. process, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So this is excellent. We've got our transparent wafer. Um, and now we need to do the, the kind of next step, which is bridge this gap between the transparent wafer and all of the kind of other pieces of this system so that we actually have a tool to run experiments with. And to just kind of outline some of these pieces, of course, we have the uh, cells. We have some sort of imaging system, some sort of inverted microscope, perhaps, to look at these cells. Uh, the wafer that we just fabricated and uh, electronics to read signals out and electronics to send signals in. So for the first prototype, the way that we um, decided to kind of make this connection between the PCB and uh, the wafer was wire bonding. So this is a kind of top view of the PCB and we have these gold contact pads on our PCB uh, and wire bonding is basically, you just have this thread of metal uh, and you just kind of press it into the contact pad. Uh, and there's like a ultrasonic component to this and you kind of just shake it back really fast, uh, heat it up slightly, and then it, it uh, melds to the uh, contact pad. Um, and then we have these connectors over here, which correspond to uh, this diagram where you could have this connector attached to this board and it attaches to this other board where you have BNC cables. Uh, and if you wanted to say, select an arbitrary electrode, uh, one of these BNC ports corresponds to that electrode. Um, and so you can ostensibly run, run your experiment this way. Uh, and kind of immediately ran into issues, which is first, uh, you know, I was able to get one of the devices where I wire bonded it uh, with aluminum directly to the ITO. So this is actually the bond pads on the wafer and these are the bond pads on the PCB. Uh, and I was able to wire bond to one device, and then the next device we made, it just didn't work at all, and I don't really know why. Um, and on that device, uh, I was having uh, a pretty decent time wire bonding to the gold contact pads on the PCB, uh, and it would just not stick to the ITO. So 
the solution was to kind of go back to the clean room and say, well, if it was working with the gold, maybe we should deposit gold on the contact pads uh, and uh, see if that works. So uh, I'd also like to kind of pause here for a moment and kind of point out that every other time we've tried to put a new material onto this wafer, uh, we've put down the material first, then we've done photolithography with the photoresist layer, and then we've done dry etching. Gold is a little bit different because uh, it doesn't react with a lot of things, and so dry etching doesn't work unless you're using like a chlorine-based process, uh, and I don't believe that the clean room supports this sort of tool. So um, instead, you do this process called liftoff. Uh, so you put down your photoresist, um, and the goal with the photoresist is you want to have no photoresist on the contact pads uh, and photoresist everywhere else. Then we can deposit our gold, uh, and this means that there's going to be a layer of gold that some of it is going to be in contact with your like substrate itself, and some of it is going to be in contact with the photoresist. And so we've got this nice coating of gold, and there's kind of gold on top of photoresist in all of these areas, uh, and on these bond pads, there's gold in direct contact with the wafer. So when we go to do our actual liftoff step, we'll heat up the wafer, uh, and this will kind of cause, and put it in this chemical solution that will cause the photoresist to dissolve. So now, this piece of gold right here uh, has no support underneath it. And when we go into the sonication bench, um, we can kind of just shake it back and forth really fast, uh, and all of the gold that isn't supported will come off, and all of the gold that is kind of in direct contact with your wafer won't. Uh, and at the end of it, you'll have gold on your contact pads and no gold anywhere else. Uh, and this is just kind of what the successful liftoff looked like, just a, a top-down view of the whole wafer. After this, you can see that there are some flecks of gold, so it didn't like entirely come off, uh, but they're small enough that it's not going to cause problems when we go to image, and by and large, they aren't uh, where the electrodes are, which is kind of the important part where we don't want gold. Um, and there was like some delamination on the bond pads, but the actual wire bonding like tip itself uh, is very small, uh, and you'll see in later pictures. So the fact that these bond pads are like mostly intact is definitely good enough for the, the thing we want to do. Uh, and so I was kind of successfully with the asterisk uh, able to wire bond. Um, you can see these lovely bonds here. Uh, and kind of getting into the, the asterisk bis bit, um, you'll notice that some of the uh, bond pads were a little more destroyed than others. Uh, and so it wasn't like really feasible to wire bond to this bond pad, for example. Uh, and additionally, when I tried to wire bond to some of the contact pads, uh, the gold would delaminate and just kind of lift up. Uh, and you can see, like, I tried to wire bond to this pad, like, uh, five or six times, and it didn't work. Uh, and this is obviously a, pro a problem. Um, and so kind of coming back, circling around to our assembled prototype 1.0, uh, we have a lot of problems. Uh, wire bonding is time consuming and fickle. It doesn't always work. And when it does work, sometimes I have to sit there wire bonding the same pad five or six times just to get it to work. And I might spend five to 10 minutes on one pad uh, and this uh, prototype that we were working with had 324 electrodes. And I had to do this for every single electrode. So you can imagine, I spent way too much time <laughs> wire bonding in the last year. Uh, and I, I didn't, didn't want to anymore. Um, additionally, this uh, design that we had didn't really have a lot of options for stimulation. Yes, we had this kind of breakout BNC board, but you had to kind of manually uh, remove cables and plug them in to have more selectivity. And if you wanted to say access electrodes on this side, you'd unplug the whole thing and plug it back in on this side for this connector. Um, additionally, uh, that's really bulky and wasn't going to fit in the microscope. And finally, uh, all of the kind of electronics for you know amplifying your signals, filtering out the noise, all of this kind of very complicated electro electrical engineering wasn't included in this PCB. Uh, so all you could really do was send in signals. So kind of going back to the drawing board, uh, I had some ideas for how to address this. The first one was, I don't want to wire bond anymore. So I'm not going to. I, instead, I'm going to put uh, solder paste on each of these bond pads. And instead of putting the uh, wafer on top of the PCB, I'm going to put it on the bottom of the PCB. 
and I can put solder paste, which is basically just like a bunch of small metal spheres um, on each of these pads, and then I can heat it up in a reflow oven, uh, and this will make a good electrical connection when it cools down. Uh, and then I can kind of do all of the bond pads simultaneously, which means no more wire bonding, which I was very, very happy about. Uh, and then once I'm done with that, I can flip it right side up, and I'll still be able to uh, put cells on it. Kind of getting into the stimulation side, uh, if we want to run meaningful experiments, we need to be able to kind of have a bunch of parameters that we have control over. One of those being, okay, I want to select an arbitrary selection of electrodes and run my experiment on them. Uh, and I also want to have all of these kind of hyperparameters on the waveforms that we're sending in. Things like the frequency, the amplitude, how long we're stimulating for, how long we're going to be quiet, how many rounds of this we're going to do. Uh, and so I thought the kind of best way to address this would be to build a system that would allow someone to kind of put in all of these parameters, press go, walk away. Uh, and it needed to be compact. It needed to fit in this inverted microscope so that you could have light shining down from this kind of uh, flashlight sort of thing through this Petri dish, which is going to hold in your cells, um, your, your media, go through the um, wafer, which is, again, on the bottom, and then reach your microscope objective at the bottom. And finally, to address the kind of electrical readout, uh, I decided to outsource it because I'm not an electrical engineer. And it turns out that uh, Intan Electronics makes these digital electrophysiology chips, uh, which kind of do all of the things that we need it to do. Uh, and they're kind of specifically for neurobiology. So it'll do all of the amplification, all of the filtering, uh, and it'll even kind of record and store our data with this recording controller that they sell. Uh, the downside is that it's very expensive. Um, and then kind of on the stimulation side, I can have this microcontroller, which I can attach to a computer just with a USB cable. I can upload instructions to the microcontroller, and those instructions can um, communicate using SPI, uh, which is just kind of a, a standard um, digital communications uh, protocol for talking to kind of like electrical circuits. And I'll have these digital to analog converters. Uh, and I can send instructions from the microcontroller to the DAX, and those will produce the waveforms that I want. Uh, and like I mentioned, that uh, recording controller is expensive. So as a kind of proof of concept, I said, I will just kind of build the stimulation system um, with the microcontroller, because that's still like, very complicated. And uh, if it works, great. Uh, there's still experiments that you can run with this system. And then we can kind of move on to bigger and better things. Uh, and try to implement this uh, recording controller. So I got to work designing. Uh, I <coughs> picked all of the electronics that were going to go onto this uh, PCB. I drew up a nice schematic. I laid out the board in Altium. Uh, and this is kind of a nice progression from laying out the board to finished project. Um, you know, this, this is a very nice picture. Uh, and it might look very simple, but this is actually like a, a good chunk of time invested <laughs> to take it from nothing to this kind of final project. Uh, and then I ordered the boards. And uh, when they got here, it was time to assemble them. So I took the wafers that I had fabricated, uh, I put the uh, solder paste on the bond pads and the uh, reference electrode, um, and I kind of flipped this over, put it on the PCB, uh, heated it up. And you'll notice that this uh, is not quite aligned in the middle, and this is because this is the kind of first picture of the like first time I tried to assemble it. Turns out, <laughs> the solder paste, when it becomes uh, liquid, has uh, surface tension, and so the um, component won't stay in the same place; it'll actually move. Uh, and this, this of course, is a problem because then then there's no <laughs> there's no electrical connection. Um, so to kind of get around this. Uh, it, I just capped on taped it, and that worked way better than I was expecting to. It just worked on the first try, I had no problems. Uh, and then here is the microcontroller, which I've kind of soldered all these things to this connector, uh, and this connector kind of plugs into this part of the PCB, so that you can have uh, this sort of modular system where you can have this microcontroller uh, connect, and you can run your experiments with this microcontroller, and say you know you build five or six of these systems, you can run five or six experiments kind of in parallel with one microcontroller. Uh, and then this is kind of prototype 2.0 uh, with the microcontroller uh, plugged into the system, which is all assembled. Uh, it's a little hard to tell that the electrodes are on there, but that's because they're transparent, so that's by design. Uh, <laughs> 
but they're there, I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is the uh, kind of whole system in this uh, fixture that I designed, um, which is kind of in, in the box that will ultimately go into the inverted microscope. Now, I kind of glibly mentioned digital to analog converters and said, oh, you can just make them have the waveform that you want. But I, I want to kind of explain how that works. Uh, and the answer is electrical engineering, uh, but I, I think since I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and you can just think of digital to analog converters as a magic box. And the magic box takes in an input, uh, such as a digital command, so ones and zeros that you kind of send with your microcontroller. Uh, and it outputs some voltage. Uh, and so if you change your output voltage by sending these commands very rapidly, you can reconstruct an analog signal uh, by just sort of like saying, okay, at, at time one, I'm going to output this voltage here, and at time two, I'm going to output this voltage here, and so on and so forth, and you can sort of reconstruct this arbitrary analog wave. Now, implementing that in code would be very difficult, uh, so fortunately for me, uh, the signals that we want to construct at the end of this are just square waves, because in the literature, that's kind of what produces the, the um, response from, from these cells. So all I really have to do is tell the digital to analog converter to output this voltage at this time and output another voltage at another time and kind of oscillate back and forth between them. Um, and it turned out that the um, digital to analog converters that I selected had a range from zero to five volts. Uh, and to just kind of give you a, a better understanding of that, that means if I put in a digital command of all zeros, it'll output zero volts. And if I put in a digital command of all ones, it'll put, in, it'll put out five volts. And I can kind of change these zeros and ones iteratively, and I can step all the way down from five volts to zero volts. And this means that you know I can take any arbitrary uh, amplitude that I want that uh, kind of a user puts in, and I get uh, kind of a, a nice square wave at the end. So to just give another example of um, like a simulation program of a, like a real experiment that someone could run, um, it might have this kind of these parameters where you say, hey, I want it to be quiet for two minutes and I want it to have burst periods of one minute. And so it'll send my desired waveform for a minute, then it'll take a break for two minutes and not send anything, and it'll do that 10 times. Uh, I also want you know, 100 millivolt amplitude, 50 hertz, uh, and I want a delay of five milliseconds between you know, I don't know, electrodes 43, 6, 27, and 22. Um, and I might have just picked these because I looked at it under the microscope and I said, oh, there's neurons on these electrodes. It might be interesting to stimulate those electrodes. Uh, and the kind of beauty of this system is you don't have to know any coding or electrical engineering to use it. You can just walk up, put in your parameters, and press go. Uh, and kind of getting to our, our current status, we are putting cells on the array and uh, we're hoping to have data soon. Uh, unfortunately, I, I believe the, the most recent batch died. Yes. <laughs> so it might be a little longer, but uh, yeah. So I'd like to take this moment to thank the Worcester Fellowship for their support of my research over the summer. I'd also like to thank Dr. Baumeister, Eve, Marcus, Kellen, Hawkins, and Majid for their mentorship and support throughout this project. Uh, and then additionally, since this is kind of the culmination of my undergraduate career, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Brent, Dr. B, Dr. Baumeister, Dr. Mazin, Dr. Hansma, and Dr. Kosick for their support of me as a, as a researcher and student.
cell compatible? Is, yeah. Are they dying because of your cell? So I, we've had, I mean, this, this picture was taken of cells that didn't die on the surface. So I think it's reasonable to conclude that it is possible to have cells be on the surface without dying. They just go to the wrong place in this picture. Yeah, this, they're like, the, the electrodes over here, and it's not on the electrodes. <laughs> they've been there for like a month. Mm-hmm. Spatula, just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. So you explain again what the purpose of the holes in the mass design were for? Yeah, so um, the purpose of that was basically if you cover the whole wafer with silicon dioxide, then nothing will be like, so you have these conductive electrodes underneath it, um, and if you cover it with silicon dioxide, then you're not going to be able to send any signals in or out because uh, it's insulated. So uh, if you open holes above the electrodes, then your neuron or whatever cell you put there um, will kind of be in contact with the ITO, and that's where the signal is going to come from, this kind of conductive material. Yeah? Could the cells grow in the wrong place be a uh, consistent problem that could happen? Uh, Maybe I, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't. I I have not put the cells on there. I don't know, Marcus. Do you know the answer to that? Well, I mean, like that's a, a common problem, uh, also with you know the commercially available Maxwell um, arrays, where you you know your limitation is you know the surface area, right? You can unfortunately not take the the cells and place it directly on it, right? You have to rely on some you know stochastic you know, uh, properties where they just sink down, where they kind of land, and you, you hope that, you know, at the high enough seeding density, you will get the, the cells there. But, but it's For Maxwell, we slice the organoids, and then we bond the organoids to the ones which are surface. So it's like different techniques where you don't see the cells directly, but, but for the primary cultures, you do see them, yeah. but the primary culture density is much higher, so that's why you have a good chance to cover the full surface compared to the fly cells. Yeah. You said the readout is going to be much, much harder yeah. or more expensive. You didn't say well, it's going to be much harder. So, so how it, it is. So the reason that I didn't design the readout myself is because that would be very, very difficult. Because um, you'd have to have amplification, because the signals from the neurons, uh, to give an example, range from I think it was 100 to 500 microvolts, which is very, very small. So you need to have a large amount of amplification. At the same time, uh, there's going to be all these like noise and artifacts that you want to filter out. And so you've got this combination of this amplification stage and all of this filtering. And then you need to convert it from an analog signal to a digital signal so that uh, it doesn't kind of um, like go like <laughs> so that you don't have this uh, decrease in the amplitude. Uh, and um, you'll actually be able to read the signal at the end. But you can buy something. But yeah, you, can, you can buy something that does all of this complicated electrical engineering for you. But how does that part that you can buy, how would you integrate it? Is that the same technology that you use now, or is to integrate it also very complicated? Uh, integrating it is not too complicated. You just kind of hook up all of the electrodes. So instead of having the um, kind of bond pads correspond to a bond pad on the wafer, um, you would have this kind of electrical component that would connect directly to these um, pads. Uh, and this would kind of read in all the signals, and all you really have to do is provide it the proper power so that it has like the, the right uh, power stage so that the, the chip has enough like uh, electricity to, to be able to, to function. So it seems time to start building. Yeah, I, I think so. You work with so many people, we should get the money together to <laughs> get the funds here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool, that's fine. Yeah. Um, do you have any idea what the noise level would be? Like, and from what sources? So you said the signal is like 500 microvolts. Uh, like, do you have any idea what level the noise would be at? Uh, so I don't, I have a backup slide for this. Um, so the, there's just kind of like this noise here, which I guess looks like around about uh, 
20, 20-ish 20 microvolts. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also these uh, local field potentials, which are kind of the, the, the noise of all of the cells kind of firing in tandem and kind of how they all uh, interact with each other. And to be able to study, say, an individual cell, you need to be able to, to get rid of that. Um, and so that's kind of where some of the filtering comes in. And those are just like baseline shifts? Or yeah, so uh, this is all the way at the beginning of the presentation, but you can, this, this trace has actually already had all of that filtered out. Yeah, okay. um, but the ones at the beginning of the presentation, I'll just say, I'm not gonna. Yeah, you showed it at the beginning. I did show it, but yeah. I'll, I'll show it again. Which is, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, you can see how there's these like curvy bits that you kind of want to uh, get rid of if you want to see exactly what's happening with a particular cell. Yeah. Uh, could you explain again how you fix the solder paste surface tension problem? Uh, I just put caps on tape on it. So I, I basically taped it down so that it wouldn't move. And then I heated it up, and it didn't move. <laughs> that, <laughs> that worked. <laughs> And so the, the biophysics groups that we're kind of collaborating with here at UCSB will be able to run their own experiments uh, with this system. And that was kind of a lot of the motivation for a lot of the abstraction that I did, so that they don't have to mess around with the electrical engineering or the co programming. They can just kind of put in these hyperparameters and run whatever experiment they want to. And they'll have a lot of flexibility that they might not otherwise have.